Welcome everyone, wherever you are in the world today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So this is our international psychology webinar. And my name is Donna and I'm one of the international student recruitment officers at the University of Tasmania. And I am your host today. So before I introduce our presenter today, may I just please remind you of our housekeeping. If you have any questions, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we will address them after the presentation. So once again, thank you for your time in attending this webinar. So we're very fortunate to have Professor Kimberly Norris. Uh, she's the head of discipline, director of postgraduate professional training programs in the psychology and counseling from the College of Health and Medicine at the University of Tasmania. So Kimberly, or we call her Kim, is a psychological scientist and clinical psychologist who works across academic research and clinical psychology practice settings. She is our very own UTAS alumna. In fact, she completed her Bachelor of Arts first class with honors at the University of Tasmania in 2004. And in 2010, she completed her PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Tasmania. Since then, she has been supervising research students across honors, masters, and PhDs. And she's also an isolation expert. She has worked um, extensively with people returning from extreme environments, such as Antarctica, along with fly-in, fly-out workers in remote places. Currently, with the COVID-19 pandemic, she has uh, claimed that emotional and psychological waves are likely after returning from isolation. She has developed strategy strategies that could help at an individual and workplace level by launching a resource called The Path Back from Social Isolation. And this is to offer perspectives on what to expect and practical ways of supporting employees and each other through this period. So wherever you are in the world today, we're so very lucky to hear from Professor Kimberly Norris to talk about psychology, modern psychologists. Over to you, Kim. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Donna. And again, a very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us today. We're very excited to have the opportunity to speak with you uh, in this setting. Well, I spoke to Donna earlier today and I was explaining that when I talk about psychology, when I talk about psychological science, I become very excited. I'm very passionate about this topic and am so privileged to be able to share this with you. Like many people, when I become excited, I can begin to speak more quickly. And if that starts to happen, please don't hesitate to pop a little note in the chat box and Donna will give me a signal just to slow back down so that you have the opportunity to understand and take in everything that is being discussed. And also a reminder that this webinar will be recorded so you can engage with it, listen to it again at a later time, and hopefully you'll be inspired to do so. After such an incredible introduction, uh, I do want to thank you again for that, Donna. I would like to perhaps emphasise a couple of things that you may not have heard before. And one is the title psychological scientist. So in Australia, in order to train as a psychologist who provides assessment, diagnosis and treatment to people who are experiencing mental health and other similar difficulties, you must first train as a psychological scientist. And essentially, that training focuses on developing an understanding and ability to apply that understanding to how people think, how people feel, and how people act. And because of that understanding, we are able to think beyond 
simple assessment, diagnosis and treatment to use our knowledge in a variety of other ways. And that's one thing I would really like you to focus on both during today's webinar as well as during the question and answer time. And it brings me to an interesting question. When you think of psychology, what do you think of? So I'd like you just to take a few moments and just think about when you hear the word psychology, what types of words come into your mind? What types of activities come into your mind? And just think about that. And as you're thinking about that, I'll just ask Donna to move to the next slide. Often when we speak to people and ask them the question, when you hear the word psychology, what do you think of? The types of things that they will talk about are psychologists. So people who use expert knowledge to assess, diagnose and treat people with mental health conditions. They might also think about the types of places that psychologists work. Because psychologists who are trained in Australia as part of an accredited training program like we offer here at the University of Tasmania are regarded very highly for their skills in providing this type of service to the community. And you will find psychologists in a range of environments like schools, hospitals, community settings, private practice, in the court setting, in prisons, following disasters, they engage with communities. And psychologists can work with an in-person, couples, families, organisations, and more. So traditionally, psychologists work with people, a range of different people in a range of different sub subjects, areas, organisations, all with a common goal, to enhance well-being, to enhance quality of life. So that's the traditional career pathway that many people think of when they think of psychology. However, psychology is in fact much broader than psychologists, hence the title of today's seminar. People who study an undergraduate degree for example, a Bachelor of Psychological Sciences here with us at the University of Tasmania, or even an honours degree in psychology with us at the University of Tasmania, can choose to progress to further training as a psychologist. But there are a range of different activities that we often find our graduates find themselves working in. For example, going back to the idea that people who study psychological science are people who have an understanding of the way we think, feel and act. We often find that psychological scientists will end up working very well in business settings, particularly if you think about human resources and human resource management. These are individuals who are very involved in designing workplaces, the environment, the culture, the policies, to ensure that people in the workplace experience high job satisfaction, 
and also partly because of that job satisfaction, also have high levels of productivity and efficiency. So psychological science graduates or psychological scientists are very highly valued for their ability to design efficient, effective, and healthy workplaces. You also find psychological science being employed a lot in marketing. So if you think about advertising, if you think about marketing, it's about understanding what your audience wants and being able to use an understanding of how the brain works to capitalise on that, to develop marketing campaigns, to develop advertising campaigns that are going to appeal to people and make them want to engage with your product. The types of things in particular that psychological science helps these individuals understand are things like persuasion. When should we use, if you like, music, excitement, bright colours, fancy lights to attract people versus when should we use deep understanding, deep um, information, deep awareness. That's something that a psychological science degree can teach you. Similarly, when thinking of marketing or advertising, deciding who to represent a brand relies on an understanding of psychological science. For example, do we go with somebody who is well-known, trusted, and who people aspire to be like? Or do we instead choose someone who is very similar to the people we are trying to attract, the people we are trying to appeal to? How do we develop a sense of community, well-being, and identity? All of these are questions that people are able to answer following a degree in psychological science. And it's a really, really exciting time in our discipline of psychological science because there is a movement towards recognising that skill, that expertise, so that if graduates exit our program with a degree in psychological science, they can actually call themselves psychological scientists and it's very very powerful because that term psychological scientist actually lets the public know lets the community know I have an ability to think critically to understand research evidence and communicate that in a clear way that I can use research evidence to make decisions to enhance people's well-being, and that I myself can even design projects, design evaluations, not just to try and achieve an outcome, whether that be increased productivity, whether that be increased well-being, whether that be increased educational outcome, but also that I can evaluate this project. I can actually measure how effective it was. So psychological science actually goes so far beyond just the treatment setting. And it makes me think about some of our more recent graduates who have gone into the world and used their psychological science skills. So, one in particular is a graduate from 2019 who completed an honours degree with us here at the University of Tasmania in psychological science. And throughout her honours degree, where she experienced firsthand the opportunity to conduct research, to practice psychological skills, to apply her knowledge in different ways, she was actually able to be employed by the health department in Tasmania, not as a psychologist, but as a health 
analyst, somebody who was able to look at all of the data about health needs, health outcomes, and to help develop policies based on improving community health and well-being. Other graduates we have had have been able to gain employment with different government agencies, including those involved in finance, those involved in health, those involved with climate science. We've also had graduates who have been employed to develop prevention programs, so helping people to stay healthy, not only to recover when they're unhealthy. We've had graduates who have been involved in marketing and have had very, very successful careers in advertising because they've had that understanding of how the human brain works. We also find that graduates with a degree that covers both psychology and something like law do very well also because they are able to take that understanding of the human condition, how the brain works, how people feel, why people act the way they do, to explain the behaviour of people in the courtroom. And so what we find is that everywhere you look in society, psychological science is at work and it can help people. And with that thought, I'll get Donna to move to the next slide. Because, of course, we have a number of students who work as psychologists. And psychologists are highly valued and imperative, so very important in today's society. As Donna mentioned earlier, one of my key research and treatment areas is supporting people who have experienced isolation. And in particular, what happens when people are able to leave isolation and they begin to come back into society? What are the things that help them with that process? And what are the challenges that they face? And given the impacts of the global pandemic, the importance of supporting mental health for people who have experienced isolation, confinement, quarantines, and the loss of loved ones has further emphasised the importance of what psychologists do. We have many international students who study our postgraduate psychology programs with us, as well as our postgraduate counselling programs. And only, only a couple of weeks ago, one of our graduates who completed the Masters in Clinical Psychology in 2018 actually got back in touch with me. This particular student came from Hong Kong, studied with us for two years and returned to Hong Kong to apply their skills in clinical psychology in helping their local community. They have been very successful working in a number of hospitals in the Hong Kong region and have recently been working with me to conduct some research about what people in Hong Kong need for their mental health. And that's a really exciting part of psychology. We know that everybody has different needs and our passion is to develop treatments that fit. They fit culturally. They fit based on people's age. They fit on people's beliefs. And so the other thing that we find is that our graduates, long after they graduate from our studies here at the University of Tasmania, continue to have a relationship with us. They continue to learn with us and we learn from them. So once you become a member of the University of Tasmania's community, you're always part of that community and we always maintain those relationships. And I think that's something that we're very privileged to be able to do, but also provides a lot of satisfaction for us as well. The final thing I'd like to touch on today before we open up to questions is 
psychological science is more than about helping other people. It's actually about helping ourselves. By studying psychological science at undergraduate, honours and postgraduate levels, people learn how to enhance their own well-being, apply their psychological knowledge to themselves. And in doing so, they experience better quality of life and are able to support others to achieve the same. The, the fancy word we use for that is psychological literacy. Essentially, using our knowledge of psychology to help ourselves as well as those around us. And I think that's very important because people who are drawn to study psychology have a desire at some level to improve the well-being of those around them. So whether that be through studying a Bachelor of Psychological Science, honours, or joining us for postgraduate studies in psychology, it really is the beginning of a lifelong relationship with the University of Tasmania and a lifelong opportunity to learn and grow both with and from the people we work with. So with that, Donna, I will close off there and open up to any comments or questions that we may have received. Thank you very much for that wonderful uh, introduction about um, psychology. I'm so amazed by how um, diverse and broad a graduate of psychology could become after studying this course. So thank you very much for enlightening. And uh, we'll come to the next slide. Um, and um, before we discuss other questions from our audience today, um, would you mind addressing this question? Like how can studying psychology enhance your own psychological health and well-being. I know that we have touched this a little bit um, in your introduction, but uh, could you please dig deeper into this um, question, if that's okay? Absolutely, thank you, Donna. Because through psychology, you learn all about how the brain works and how the brain works with the body, it's a really exciting way to reflect on how my brain thinks, how my brain works, and what helps me work best. So you become more aware of the types of thought patterns you have and the way you make decisions. Because we train you in understanding research and using data, evidence, research findings to solve problems in society, you can use that same process in solving problems or challenges for yourself. One of the most simple ways to do this is where is the proof this thought is 100% true and where is the proof this thought is not 100% true? Because often our brain forgets to question the thoughts. We treat thoughts as facts actually thoughts are simply thoughts and we can change those thoughts and because the way we think affects the way we feel and the way we feel affects the way we act if we change the way we're thinking we can change the way we're feeling if we change the way we're feeling it changes the way we act and it can even work in the opposite direction if we change the way we're acting it can change the way we're feeling. And if we change the way we're feeling, it can change the way we're thinking. That's a really important thing to keep in mind when we can apply psychological health studies to our own health and well-being. Because you may have noticed, when you're happy, your brain finds it very easy to think of other happy things, to remember happy events. We call that mood-dependent memory. That's important because if you're feeling sad, your brain will more easily think of sad things. 
and all member sad things. So if you're feeling very sad and would like to feel differently, you can focus on a happy event, something that you're looking forward to, something that made you laugh. And by deliberately focusing on that and understanding mood-dependent memory, you can actually shift your brain to remember those good things and to focus on good things. The other big way you can apply the knowledge of psychological health and well-being is, for example, capitalising or making the most of that brain-body connection. So if you're feeling a bit stressed, a bit worried, what's happening is your brain is sending a message to your body, danger, danger, danger. And your body says, oh, there's danger. I better get ready to protect myself. Now, whether that protection is fighting the threat, running away from the threat, it actually doesn't matter because your body does the same thing. It gets ready to either run away or to defend yourself. Now, that makes sense. It's what helps keep us alive. But if your body is very tight and tense, then it sends a message back to your brain. You're right. There is danger. And your brain says, ah, stay ready. Fight that danger. And you get stuck in a loop. Now, because psychological scientists understand that loop, this is what we do. We get the message from our brain, danger, danger, danger. And we notice our body getting tight. We notice our body getting tense. And so we deliberately relax our body. And we teach you how to do this. And when that means when the brain is sending this message of danger, 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 worry, 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 our body says, it's okay. There's nothing to worry about here. And your brain says, oh, okay then, I won't worry. And the worry goes away. So these are the things, and many more, of course, that teach you people as part of their training in undergraduate, honours and beyond, that helps people have a better quality of life, enhance their own psychological health and wellbeing, and take those skills with them into the world, into the long-term experiences that might have. Thank you so much, uh, Kim, for that. That's fascinating to hear. It's making me um, interested into this uh, discipline myself. So, <laughs> wonderful. It's fascinating. Um, next slide, shall we uh, proceed? Um, these are the some of the frequently asked questions about the, the course of becoming a registered psychologist. So um, can you please um, explain further about entry requirements and some further information regarding this course, please? Absolutely. Just one moment. Sorry, I'm just getting a little bit of feedback here. I'll just adjust the setting. <laughs> that's a little bit better as you say there can be a lot of questions that people have about how they can train to be a psychologist in Australia the first step is to complete an accredited undergraduate degree so that's a three-year degree something like what we offer in the Bachelor of Psychological Science following that it's a one-year honours degree in an accredited program so on the slide, you'll see the word APAC. Now, APAC stands for the Australian Psychology Accreditation Council. And essentially, all of our programs at the University of Tasmania are fully accredited with APAC. And what that means is if you study them with us, you are eligible to become a psychologist in Australia, providing after honours, you enrol in and complete one of the postgraduate pathways. So that might be what's called the five plus one pathway, which is a one year full-time equivalent study program, which is followed by one year of supervised practice, or our two year Master of Clinical Psychology degree, 
which is a two-year program that includes coursework, a research thesis and placement. Now to enter into those five plus one or the clinical psychology master's program, you need to have achieved for the master of psychology clinical, a minimum upper second class honours degree. And for the five plus one pathway, a minimum second class honours degree. And that's actually the law in Australia. That's not set by the University of Tasmania. That's actually set by the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency and monitored by the Psychology Board of Australia. Once you complete either the five plus one or the two year master degree, you are able to call yourself a psychologist and practice in Australia as a registered psychologist. Thank you very much, Kim. Now we've, uh, we'll now proceed to addressing the questions uh, of our audience. And um, one of the questions from Francesca, it relates to the entry requirements. So she's asking um, students who have completed Master of Psychology, would this help in the application for Master of Clinical Psychology? can do, yes. It's not necessary, but it can assist. So the way people apply for both the Master of Professional Psychology, which is the five plus one pathway, and the Master of Clinical Psychology, which is the two year degree, is that you need to submit an application which shows that you've met the entry criteria, shows that you uh, have met the English language performance requirements, and also as part of that, you actually write a one page personal statement, which is where you describe for us why you would like to be a psychologist. On top of that, you will also need to provide referee reports. Just one moment, please. I won't be a moment. My apologies. Um, and basically what happens then is you are invited to an interview. And during that interview, you will be asked a range of questions. We can't disclose them here because that would be unfair. We, everybody needs to have the same opportunity. And following that interview, decisions are made about how many, start, how many students will be made an offer. We make our offers in November and December of each year. And we find that this provides enough time for any international students to make necessary arrangements to travel to Australia. To come back to your original question, does the Master of Professional Psychology help with getting into the Master of Clinical Psychology? It can, but you don't have to do that pathway. You can apply for direct entry into the Master of Clinical Psychology. That's great, Kim, thank you very much. Another follow-up question for that, it's in relation to work placement during the course. So how crucial it is to have work placement during the four years of studies? And may I know what is taken in consideration when applying for Master of Clinical Psychology? Certainly. There is no requirement for work placement during the first four years of study. So that's during the undergraduate or the honours degree. There's no requirement. However, if people are able to do some work or some volunteering that involves interacting with people, that can help the application because what it shows us is that you've had some experience talking to people, dealing with people and being able to engage with them on that very personal level. It does not need to be as a counsellor. It does not need to be with people with mental health issues. You could have worked at a supermarket and you can talk to us about how you've learned to manage challenging situations to provide people support. So it can be any work at all the key is to show us how that's helped you develop and show your skills in talking with and working with people. Thank you very much, Kim. Now, um, Tracy Bao, 
is one of our audience and um, she wanted to know um, to say, uh, hi Kim, please let me know whether students can study graduate diploma in counseling instead of honors year or the fourth year then study two year master of clinical psychology will they meet education requirements for becoming a registered psychology? This is an excellent question. The graduate diploma in counselling is not an alternative pathway to psychology. It's, it's a different pathway to become a counsellor. And it's one that could be very, very interesting and useful for people. We are able to offer our graduate uh, certificate and graduate diploma in counselling to people, even if they don't come to Australia. But we can only offer the postgraduate psychology programs for people who come to Australia. That's actually the requirements that the law place on us. If you do your honours degree, because that you must do that honours degree to be eligible to transition to postgraduate training, the masters, and then you complete your masters of clinical psychology, you have met all the education and all professional development requirements to work as a registered psychologist in Australia. If you would like to, you can then do an additional training and supervision to be called a clinical psychologist. So that's an extra 80 hours of supervision and 80 hours of professional development after you become a generally registered psychologist. Excellent. Thanks for that, Kim. Now, um, a lot of our students and agents ask about internship opportunities for all of the courses that um, uh, we are offering. Can you please tell us a bit more if, if there are opportunities for internship in this course? There are no opportunities for internship in this course in the traditional sense, and that's because of the regulations we work under. Instead, during the postgraduate training programs, whether that be the five plus one or the clinical masters, we organise placements for you. And what that means is that you will, uh, if you're doing the professional masters, you will do a placement in our university psychology clinic and you will see clients for both therapy and assessment. If you are doing our clinical masters course, you will do a placement in our university psychology clinic and you will do at least two other placements out in the community that we organise for you, that we support you through, that we provide all the supervision for, and it gives you an opportunity to experience lots of different types of client work and then use that in your everyday practice once you're a registered psychologist. So we organise all of those placements. You don't need to worry at all. And we do talk to you about what your interests are and we try to match it up as closely as possible with your interests in psychology. Lovely, that's wonderful. Thank you, Kim. Okay, I'm, I'm very conscious about our time. So we've just got about um, 10 minutes left, but um, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to ask Kim directly about, um, I'm so um, interested to find out what inspired you to become a clinical psychologist and scientist. Can you please oh. us? Can you please share that? Thank you. Um, I have always been very, very interested in how the human brain works and how the human brain changes over time and adapts to challenges. And in particular, why some people actually seem to do very well following these challenges and other people struggle more. So in other words, what's the secret to staying mentally well? And how can we use that to help people who are not as mentally well? And that's a question that I have been so excited by and interested in since I was quite young. And through my studies at the University of Tasmania and the opportunity to learn from world leading experts and be involved in their research, either as a participant or as a research assistant or later as a researcher myself, it gives me so many ways to give back to the community. And as I said before, to continue learning. And that's what excites me about psychology, that it's a place where you can say, I don't know, 
And that's a perfectly appropriate answer. And that from that I don't know, we can then conduct further research, training, so that we do know. But I would have to say the inspiration of working with incredible staff and incredible students, and particularly the University of Tasmania's focus on recognising people's individual strengths and individual interests to create a really unique and community-focused learning experience. So whether you're coming from overseas, whether you're coming from interstate, or whether you're a local person in Tasmania, you are able to shape your learning based on your interest and take your knowledge of psychological science back home with you to help you and help the people you care about. So for me, it's always been answering questions about how people think, feel and act, and now having the privilege of being able to share that with students as well. It's, it's something that I'm so, so excited by. I have worked in other places, I have worked overseas, and I always come back to the University of Tasmania because of the community and because of the excitement that it delivers. Thank you, Kim. I can really see the passion uh, reflecting in your, um, as, as the way you talk about your experience. So thank you so much for that. So I did mention a while back, you're a graduate of Utah's, so you're a very own a product. And uh, I'm interested to find out how was your experience as a Utah student, um, any lifelong experience that you might like to share to our prospective students? I think something that I've touched on a couple of times already today is the fact that from my very first day of my very first year at the University of Tasmania, I felt that I was part of a community. I was welcomed, and, and this is a, a, something that I, I actually use today. I was welcomed as an emerging colleague. So even on my very first day of study, I was welcomed into a community of psychological science and given opportunities to be involved as much or as little as suited me. So the things that I remember are uh, discussions, not just the lectures themselves, but the discussions that would be stimulated and that no matter what was happening, a lecturer was, all, lecturer was always happy to answer your questions, to make time to talk to you, to sit with you to explain a concept or to help you understand an assignment. And even after you got an assignment marked, they would make time to sit with you and explain here are the things you're doing really well. Keep doing these things. Here are the things to keep working on and here's how you can do that better. So this sense that we are all important, we all belong, and that not just was I an emerging colleague, but I was actually the future of psychology. So being given that message, I felt so very welcome and it's something that I've really carried with me. And, again, I believe that's why... I, as you say, I, I'm a very proud graduate and why I choose to work at the University of Tasmania because that sense of welcome, that sense of community is something you don't find everywhere. And it, it's, it's what keeps me coming back, just that opportunity for students to ask those questions, engage in that way. It's so very exciting. That's wonderful to hear, Kim. It's so reassuring to, to know that our prospective students would get, get all the help needed to become a successful psychologist or Utah's graduate. So um, as a follow-up with that uh, question, um, what was the most, I'm interested to hear about what was the most valuable tool or support you have had that enabled you to become a successful psychologist? I think that there are two different aspects here. One of the most valuable tools is something that I was taught very early in my degree and it was continually reinforced and, and built upon throughout all my studies, and that was question everything. 
So question, if I'm having a reaction to something, why? Why am I reacting that way? If I read about something or hear something that is different to what I used to believe, what, what does that mean? And I was taught very early that if you leave a lecture confused, that actually means you've learned something because it means you've moved your pre-existing knowledge around to make room for new knowledge. And as you process that knowledge, the confusion will drop and you're left with more information, more expertise. So the ability of staff to be supportive but still challenging, still challenging us to go beyond our pre-existing abilities. The other part was actually my community of peers, so the people I was studying with, that through developing that network of support, I was able to, again, feel further reassured and supported because I am the first person in my family, my whole family, to ever go to university. And so I didn't have anyone who understood what university was like. And I didn't have anyone I could ask for help in my studies. So to be able to go on campus and sit next to people who were learning the same things as me and struggling with the same things as me, and then as a team, problem solve together, support one another to, again, develop that knowledge, that was so wonderful. I looked forward to being on campus with my peers to learn with and from me. That's, that's a very inspiring experience, Kim. Um, last question now, understanding that we only have a few minutes left in, in our webinar. Um, the last question would be, um, I know that you mentioned about a, a student from Hong Kong studied uh, the course at the Utah's and then went back to Hong Kong and practiced uh, as, a, as a psychologist in there. So would you mind sharing other success stories that you have that um, especially our international student graduates, where are they now and what are they doing? Wonderful, thank you. Um, many of our international students choose to complete their degree and then return to their home country so that they can use their skills with people in their home country. So only last year, one of our graduates who came to us from India uh, was able to complete her degree and she has gone back to India and has actually opened up a clinic, a mental health clinic for people with limited financial resources. So people who would find it hard to pay for psychology, she has specially opened up a clinic to support people from her region in India that she comes from. Other success stories have included people who have come to us from, we have a lot of students who come from the Asia Pacific region and they choose to go back to their areas because the degree in clinical psychology, the degree as a registered psychologist in Australia is very, very highly valued internationally. And so our graduates end up working not just in their country of origin, but many will choose to work in other countries, such as in Europe, the United States of America, in Britain. And we actually have a number of students who come to us from Europe as well, because we, tr we train them in a different way. And so they will actually sometimes even have an existing psychology degree in Europe and like to come to Australia and be trained in our system. The other students that we have uh, who come from overseas and are our international enrolments will sometimes choose to stay and work with us in Tasmania, at least for a little while. And it's really exciting because for many of them, they're able to work in an area that would be quite different if they went straight back to their country of origin. So for example, a lot of our international students are very, very interested in working in some of our more rural areas in Tasmania. So in towns where there are perhaps only a couple of hundred people and learning how to work in a small community where people know one another and where you might have less access to some of the resources that people in cities 
have. And a number of our international students have come back from those placements and said to us, what an incredible learning opportunity it was. They felt so welcomed in the community, but they also learned how they could take that away and use that in other settings. So for us, we are so very lucky that we have so many students from overseas interested in study with us, and we're able to provide them an environment which inspires them to go back to their country of origin and share that knowledge, or even they fall in love with Tasmania and choose to stay working here with us longer term. There are so many stories I'd love to share, but I am very aware of time. So I will turn back over to you, Donna. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation, Kim. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. I'm sure that our audience have enjoyed listening from your uh, presentation. Um, some of our other questions that were asked, we didn't address that, but uh, feel free, you've got our email address in here on the uh, screen. Please feel free to give us a call. There's a phone number in there and we also have our email address. And you, if you want to find more information about psychology, the, uh, the website is here as well, or simply send an email to us and um, if there's any curly question, I'll, I'll send it to um, Professor uh, Kimberly Norris to help, uh, help me out with that. So once again, thank you so, so much for your time today. And uh, wherever you are in the world, it's good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Bye, everyone. <laughs>